earlier, but going back now uh, to the Arab Spring for you this evening as our special coverage continues, let's turn to London for some more insight from Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos, editor of Politics First magazine. Thanks for being with us this evening. The first uprising in Tunisia began over a year ago and saw President Ben Ali flee the country. Now that free elections have been held, do Tunisians truly have something to celebrate for this new year? Well, I think it would, it, it would take a very brave political commentator to try and predict uh, the future, especially of a region like the Middle East. But on the positive side for Tunisia, it, um, it, it suffered the least amount of blood set, bloodshed and violence of all the countries which were involved in the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening, as perhaps it should be called and its recent uh, parliamentary elections, they went smoothly. However, I would uh, uh, add a note of caution, perhaps a caveat, that looming in the background over Tunisian politics, and indeed in other Arab countries, is Islamism. The party which won the most seats in the recent parliamentary elections in Tunisia is an Islamist party, and it is alleged to have had, at some point, uh, links to Al-Qaeda. So. I would be careful about uh, labelling Tunisia a success story. I think we just uh, we need to concentrate more closely on what will be happening in the next year in Tunisia. Dr. Papadopoulos, it's Kevin Owen here. Uh, thanks for being with us. Um, I'd like to focus on uh, Egypt now, get your thoughts about that for a minute. Uh, former President Mubarak, of course, on trial. We've all seen that in the countries in the middle of its parliamentary elections right now. But, of course, what we've also seen is that in recent weeks, there have been new protests met by a military crackdown that's left more than a dozen people killed. Why is there still little sign, do you think, of peace nearly a year after that revolution all started? Well, you know, Egypt really epitomizes the definition of a Pandora's box. Essentially, there's three groups in Egyptian politics, all vying for power. The military, the Islamists, which are broken down into the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists, and then you have the liberal-minded uh, Egyptian politicians. Now, the most powerful two groups are the first two, the, the, the military and the Islamists. And both groups, they, they have very little trust among, for, uh, for each other. There's a lot of resentment amongst each other. And that would explain why you're seeing so much violence recently um, on the streets of Cairo. But I would like to add, however, that this, this is potentially nothing compared to what could happen. It would appear that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is, is on the verge of coming to power. And of course, if it did come to power, what would be its stance towards Israel? Uh, a, a state that the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't recognize, a state that it resents. Um, potentially, we could be in a situation where Israel and Egypt uh, are at loggerheads again, as they were uh, following the establishment of, uh, of the State of Israel. So I think, um, I think a lot worse could come out of Egypt. Uh, it's Anissa again. I'd like to focus on Libya, if I could. Colonel Gaddafi is no more, of course. Although the country is now run by some of his former allies, tensions are on the rise between tribal groups who were kept largely at bay during the Gaddafi era. Will Libya's new rulers be able to cope? Well, I mean, the NTC was always a peculiar organization. Uh, it was made up of so many different groups, and the only thing they had in common, these groups, was that they hated, uh, they hated Gaddafi. And, you know, far from being, you know, the conflict in Libya, far from being a war between uh, authoritarianism and freedom, it was actually a tribe against tribe war. Um, and so far we can see that the NTC hasn't achieved what it set out to achieve. In Tripoli, for example, there's, arm, there's armed militias who are refusing to put down their weapons. And also as well, we, we are hearing disturbing reports and accounts that Al-Qaeda has uh, achieved a presence in Libya, which of course it couldn't do when Colonel Gaddafi was in charge of the country. And so I think it's quite worrying, and, and the, the early signs demonstrate that the NTC really isn't in control of the country. And I'd also like to add as well that, um, you know, it, a few weeks ago it was reported that Al-Qaeda flags were flying from NTC buildings in Benghazi. I would like to see politi politicians in America, Britain and France publicly asking why on earth uh, Al-Qaeda flags are flying in, uh, in a major Libyan city. I think it's very worrying. 
Doctor, a final thought from you, if we may, about Syria, with thousands of people reportedly killed there in the crackdowns on demonstrations since March. Some are suggesting the country's on the brink of civil war. What's pushing the conflict along, do you think, and what will solve it now? Undoubtedly, the, uh, the, the opponents of President Assad um, have taken a lot of encouragement for what, from what's happened in Tunisia and from what's happened in Libya. Um, but it would be, it'd be very difficult to not believe that uh, the hand of America is not at play in Syria. Remember, Syria and America um, have very difficult relations and it would certainly be in the interest of America and other Western countries for President Assad um, to fall. Um, in regard to how can it be sorted out, well, there's positive steps that have happened recently. We now have observers in the country from the Arab League um, who, are, who are reporting candidly and are not really saying the things that the Syrian opposition want to hear and also the things that Western politicians don't want to hear. But I think in order to resolve it, we have to hear what the report will be in either January or February next year from the Arab League uh, uh, observers and we need to take it from there. We, the international community needs to act as a mediator and it certainly doesn't help the situation for American politicians and French and British politicians to be taking the side either implicitly or, or explicitly of the Syrian opposition. It's only inciting things and inciting more violence and as a result ordinary people are being harmed. All right, Dr. Marcus Papadopoulou, editor of Politics First magazine, live with us on the line from London this New Year's Eve. A very happy New Year to you, arriving there in London in uh, 